Welcome to the Adaptive Collaborative Podcast, connecting the adaptive community. Hosted by James Norris, founder of Handy Capable Fitness, and Melissa DeCellis, founder of Adaptively Abled Amputees and Adaptively Abled Fitness. Without further ado, I want to welcome my, my co-host and the better half of the Adaptive Collaborative Podcast, uh-huh. Melissa DeCellis. Melissa, thank you for joining us. And I ask that you kind of give a quick two-minute elevator pitch just to get things started. Okay. And then I'll interject with questions and we can go from there. Okay. So the quick, first of all, I'm so excited that all of you are here today to join our podcast. Um, I have been wanting to share my story publicly, the whole story, for a long time when I was training as an Adaptive Training Foundation athlete down in Dallas. September is going to be three years ago. I can't believe it's been three years. But three years ago, they challenged me to journal my story and to finally share it publicly for the first time. I was able to share it publicly down in Dallas, Texas. I've had a few other speaking engagements where, depending on the audience, I may share certain parts of my story. But today, you guys get to hear the whole deal. So I was born with a congenital club foot. Um, Basically, my toes were wrapped around my foot and ankle when I was born. I had multiple reconstructions as a child. And what I didn't know was I was born an adaptive athlete. I just wasn't aware of this tribe and this community until I lost my leg 33 years later. And I really wish that I had been introduced to this community earlier on in my childhood. I think it would have made a really positive impact. So I was born with a club foot. I had multiple reconstructions, but my family didn't treat me any differently. They just told me that in order to keep up with able-bodied peers, I just had to work harder. So they threw me into dance lessons and uh, gymnastics. I played soccer, basketball, softball. You can find me most afternoons playing home run derby with the boys down at the baseball field. And that's where my love of baseball and softball started. I was a three-sport athlete throughout high school. And in a state tournament game for Lynn Classical High School, there was a pass ball past the catcher. I was the go-ahead runner on third base, and I decided to go for it. Gave it my all, slid into home. We ended up winning the game on the spot, but my cleat had hit the plate head-on, and I completely destroyed, dislocated, fractured, tore most of the tendons and ligaments in my foot, completely destroyed my already compromised foot and ankle. From that point on, I really started my recovery, and I didn't know it, but my life was going to change at that moment. So I want to interject here real quick and going, going back to that. So as, as you were you know, laying there on the field and your team was going crazy celebrating, you, you've, had, you've had numerous surgeries at this point. What, what, were, what were you thinking to yourself? Were you thinking, oh, my God, here we go again. Here's another surgery. Or did you know that this, in fact, was going to be a defining moment in your life? At that given moment, I was so excited that I, as a freshman on the varsity softball team, had just won the state tournament game. And I just heard the crowd erupting in the stands. But then I went to move and realized that I kind of lay motionless. My body had gone into shock. And I laid and couldn't move on home plate looked down and I saw my foot completely turned in the other direction. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is my bad ankle. I can't believe I just broke it that badly. I didn't really know it at that moment because I had been through so many surgeries. And when you've been through so many, what's one more? What's one more recovery? Like you just show up, you put in the work and you go through that surgery and that recovery, just like all the other ones that you've done before. So I really wasn't thinking that it was anything different. I would have them fix up my leg, and in no time, I'd be back on the courts and softball fields. Good as new. But unfortunately, that really wasn't the case for me. <laughs> now, now, at the time, did you, did you know anything about elective amputation? Did that ever you know, cross your mind? 
Absolutely not. And I feel in medicine, doctors are trained to fix and to save. So from that point on, I entered a really long journey of multiple medical teams trying to fix and save my leg. It was reconstruction after reconstruction, pain procedure, nerve block, physical therapy, bracing, casting, crutches. To all the adaptive athletes in this chat today, you understand what I'm talking about, but it was a perpetual process of constantly recovering. And you really don't have a moment to really sit back or feel sorry for yourself because you're constantly in survival mode. And it wasn't until years later that I kind of exited that survival mode and started to, started to thrive again. Now, I mean, I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, at this point, like I said, you had had multiple surgeries and it's not, it's not like, oh, you broke your wrist and, you know, then you broke your pinky. I mean, these are, these are major surgeries you're having. So, so really as a young adult and a teenager at that point, what was, what was the motivation to use what you said? Okay, this is just one more. Just fuck up and deal with it. We got one more. Um. I was a freshman and I was a freshman starter on the varsity team. And I grew up in the city of Lynn in a socioeconomically challenged family. And I knew that my ticket to college were through student athletic scholarships. So all I had on my mind was do what needs to be done to fix the ankle, to be back again for the next season, to finish out all four years. And I actually did that. I had to take off a season of soccer in the fall. And instead of playing basketball that season, I ended up joining the swim team. And I got stronger and rehabbed in the pool. I discovered my love of swimming and anything having to do with the water at that point. And it really helped prepare me for the next season for softball. So I had worked really hard to rehab to get back into the game and to be back on that softball field for the next three seasons until I graduated from high school. I absolutely, I absolutely love that. And in a way it's kind of, it's kind of foreshadowing for what you've, what you've done now. I mean, it's the water as anybody knows in the adaptive community, it's amazing for our bodies. And, and one thing that you always say and always sticks out in my mind is that you've always been an adaptive athlete. You just didn't know it at the time. Um, so let so let's fast forward to, to after school, after you, you know, went on to college and Holy Cross and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I ended up having, so real quick to segue in, I, during my basketball season in my senior year, the plate and screws that were holding my leg together started to move. And my orthopedic surgeon wanted to go in and remove the hardware and fuse the ankle to give my ankle more stability. He waited for me to finish out my senior season of softball. We just taped and braced the leg. And he waited until after my graduation and my prom so that I could walk across the stage and receive my diploma. And the next Monday, I was in for major reconstructive surgery. They did a triple fusion and if anything could have happened during that surgery, it did. My foot got infected with staph and strep. My whole bottom of my foot blistered. I told them that there was a burning and bubbling under the cast, but the doctors said that they couldn't take the cast off for four weeks because they were afraid that the bones were too fragile and that they, would, that they would move. So they waited the four weeks, and by the time they finally cut the cast off, the whole bottom of my foot was covered in blisters and was completely macerated. I then started the very arduous process and painful process of debridement. So they basically had to debris the entire bottom of my foot. They would take me to PT. They would soak my foot in sterile water. They would wrap it up in sterile towels. They'd bring me to plastic surgery. They'd give me a Percocet. And the nurses would hold me down on the table as doctors scraped the bottom of my foot off. It took about a year for the whole bottom of the foot to heal. And during this, I was a freshman in college, and I chose to go to Holy Cross, which if you don't know the campus, it's on Mount St. James, and the entire campus is completely terraced. But I was determined. I wanted to go off to college to become an orthopedic surgeon. 
to help other children that were born with congenital birth defects like myself. So as a bio pre-med student at Holy Cross, I got all across campus all four years in a cast on crutches and I graduated bio pre-med. I got my EMT certification, but unfortunately the first time I went to go bear weight on my foot, my heel pad completely ripped off the calcaneus and every time I stepped, I was crushing my plantar nerve. And that's when my true chronic pain journey began because not only did I have muscular and bone pain, but then I had searing nerve pain every time I stepped. We tried several reconstructions to try to reconnect it. We took hardware in and out. We tried braces and orthotics. But at the end of the day, I used to buy cases of athletic tape and I learned how to teardrop tape my heel into place every day. Got really good at putting on that kind of fake smile, like everything's okay. Well, in, internally, you know that your mind and your body are screaming at you. I ended up getting my EMT certification. I worked in a trauma room to get clinical experience. I worked at Boston Children's Hospital, Beth Israel, Deaconess Hospital. I worked at um, Brigham and Women's in several different research lab, getting research experience. I then embarked on a medical mission trip to the jungles of Guatemala. I was enrolled in a Spanish immersion program where I would learn medical Spanish in the morning and in the afternoon I would volunteer in a jungle clinic. I was truly living life. At this moment, I knew that I wanted to move on to medical school and I wanted to do Doctors Without Borders to be able to do medical mission trips to help children that had orthopedic injuries and were born with congenital birth defects. So then I finally got all my ducks in a row. I applied to medical school. I had an opportunity to go to a US program abroad that focused on tropical medicine. I went to Ross University. It was this little blip of an island in the West Indies. It's called the Nature Island of the Caribbean. It was absolutely beautiful. I could only bring 60 pounds on my person to one, survive on a third world island, and two, to attend medical school. So I get to the island and classes are going great. I met some really incredible people. But every morning, in order to get my food for the, every Saturday morning, in order to get my food for the week, I needed to set my alarm for 5 a.m., pack every bag I had in a backpack and then hike two miles into the village to the farmer's market because all of the good produce and food were gone by 7 a.m. So we had to get there by six to be able to get good picks for the week. All we're, um, all, sorry to cut you off. So all we're dealing with this bad foot that you this literally- This bad foot, I just taped up, up and put on a smile because I was determined to graduate from medical school. And- That's it was great. I mean, the funny thing is on the island, um, the only time there were fish were when the fishermen would stand on the pier and blow a big conch shell. So everybody rushes to the pier and here I am, a Boston city girl. <laughs> and I go with my Tupperware container thinking that I'm going to get a nice skinned filet of yellow tail tuna. No, that's not the case. <laughs> When I get to the pier, the fisherman throws me this whole fish. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I going to do with this? So here I am with my roommates back in my the, like, communal kitchen, and we're YouTubing how to descale and de-vein a fish. <laughs> it wasn't pretty, but we had some meat for a while. Basically, I lived off of protein guava shakes, and I, I swear I'll never find a guava that tastes as good as it did on the island. I was living life. I was succeeding in the program and I had everything I had ever worked hard for in the palm of my hand. But then there's always the but. That next morning, I woke up with absolutely horrific calf pain. I'm like, I can't miss class, so I'm hobbling off to class. By the end of the afternoon, my whole leg was swollen and red and I knew something was wrong. I went to the student health center and I'm like, can I have an ice pack? Cause I think I might've pulled a muscle and they're like, we don't just give out ice packs unless we look at the leg. I'm glad that they did. And I'm glad that there was a top notch doctor there to diagnose. She was able to diagnose a blood clot in my leg. 
unfortunately, the physicians that taught on the island didn't have practicing rights on that particular island. They were there on sabbatical just to teach, but they couldn't function as treating physicians. So if you were a student and you got sick, you weren't treated at the medical school. What they did was they threw me in the back of a pickup truck. They drove me through the volcanic mountain pass to the other side of the island where we pull up to this adobe hut with no windows and no doors. And I was absolutely terrified. Okay, I, I, have, to, I have to stop you right there because this, this sounds like something you'd see out of National Geographic. Like, literally, what was, what was going on in your head? Because as, as, as I'm hearing you talk about this, I'm hearing, like, Steve Irwin in my head. Like, just, like, this is, this is crazy. So, like, you know, what, what was going through your head? Did you, did you think you were going to die at this point? Or? Well, I, the whole truck ride over... All I could think was, I got this. You got this. You've been through, like, you got this. Like, it's game time. They're going to check it out. They're going to treat you. You're going to get it back. You'll be back in class in a few days. Like, don't worry about it. And then they bring me in. No windows, no doors. It's 100 degrees. There's bugs everywhere. I'm legit laying on a canvas cot, no bedding. They give me a paper Johnny, which was probably past my knees. But that's what I wore at the hospital. What I didn't realize is when people were sick on the island, they had their families bring food, water, toilet paper, clothes. So I didn't have a family there to bring me all those necessities. So I was drinking contaminated water. I had a communal shared bedpan for the entire unit. I had to rip off pieces of my Johnny as my toilet paper. And it was at that moment when they reversed, I had clotted because I was on birth control. There's other factors later on, and I have a new diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos, and they think that that had a lot to play in my story all along. We just didn't know it at the time. But I threw a spontaneous clot. They tried to reverse the clotting factors, and because they took me off of birth control, I started hemorrhaging. And I'm sitting in my own puddle of blood with bugs swimming in it. And at that point, I only had a few cells left on my cell and I called my mom. And I told her, mom, I just want to let you know that I'm in the hospital, but I'm okay and I'm going to fight and I'll try to keep you updated when I can. And at that point in my mind, I thought that this was the end. In walks in three medical students from the school that were doing a rotation to shadow at the hospital. They were further on in the program and they were getting ready to start their internships back in the U.S. and this was their last clinical. They saw the look in my eyes and I told them, I said, you need to get me out of here or I am going to die. And they said, yeah, you're going to. Oh they said, God. give us your apartment keys. We promise you, hang on for tonight. We'll be back in the morning will bring you everything you need. They got other students to pitch in and they brought me gallons of water. They brought me food. They brought me pillows and bedding. They brought me clothes. They brought me my books. They bought me a cell phone charger so that I could stay in contact. And they personally went to the dean of the college and arranged for me to be transferred back to campus. I was transferred back to campus and I had house calls from one of the one of the professors at the college, I tried to go to classes for a few days, but two days after being home, I actually lost pulses in my leg and they needed to med flight me off the island. I had to leave emergently. I left all of my things on the island and I literally just brought clothes for what I needed for the next part of my recovery. Unfortunately, the medical school insurance only guaranteed that they would med flight you to the first U.S. territory, but ha which happened to be Puerto Rico. It wasn't the tourist side. It was more of the slum side of Puerto Rico. And thank goodness I had gone and volunteered in Guatemala and learned medical Spanish because it's the medical Spanish that I learned while in Guatemala that helped save my life while I was stuck in Puerto Rico until I was medically cleared to be med flighted home to Boston. They wanted to put in an IVC or an inferior vena cava filter 
and they were afraid if I flew, I would stroke out. But I saw the conditions of the hospital, and I didn't think I was going to leave without sepsis, so refused. Again, a previous connection and fate intertwined. I had volunteered in a vascular biology lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Because I had my cell phone and my charger, I called the director of the lab, and he helped to arrange for a med flight for me to come home to Boston. And at that point, they put me on a lot of clot-busting anticoagulants. I worked with physical therapy, and I actually rehabbed the leg. I needed medical insurance, so I had to take a job working as a receptionist at a family dental practice. Um, and people knew I had been through something significant, and they're like, you need to cheer up. You need to come out with us tonight. So they invited me out to a party and they said, we have a guy that we think would be a good match for you. Oh, yeah. And they introduced me to my now husband, Mike. If everything hadn't happened, we would not have crossed paths and fate yet intertwined again and introduced me to my rock who's sitting over there. <laughs> who's been with me every step of the way. So I get home, I go through my rehab, I start a relationship with Mike, but all of my clothes, all of the things I brought to the island were still in my dorm room. They had packed them up in boxes and they were holding my spot in the class. Now, most people who had gone through an experience like that, they would have said, forget it, keep it, I'm done. <laughs> Fate has told me that this med school thing was just not meant to be. Yeah, hundred percent. And they would not have returned. But what what made you want to go back? I had started something that I had for my entire life worked towards. So I wasn't ready to give it up that easily. I knew it would be difficult. I knew it would be traumatizing. But I had to finish what I started. Like you fall down, you get back up, and that was my nature from the very beginning. So against all advice from everybody I knew, I got back on a plane and went back to the island of Dominica to finish what I started. Classes were going okay, but I needed to stay fit and active. There was a very small gym with my ankle. I couldn't really use a lot of the cardio equipment. So I would go to the beach and I would swim. There were two piers, which were probably about a quarter mile apart. And I would swim peer to peer for like an hour whenever I got a break. On one particular day, I decided to go for a long swim. I brought my towel and my beach bag and I dropped it on the sand and I started to swim peer to peer. I get out of, out of the ocean feeling refreshed and energized. I take my towel and I literally wipe down every exposed inch of skin. And a few hours later, I thought I was having a severe allergic reaction. I went to the student health center and there they gave me Benadryl, they gave me steroids and they said, just sleep it off. But I literally felt my skin crawling and it got worse and worse. I went back to the student health center and they took a look at my file and they knew that I had gone through something traumatic the year before and they thought it was psychosis. So they sent me to go see a psychiatrist on the island who told me that what I was feeling, and then I started to see things moving and swimming. My hair would stand on edge almost like goosebumps. Oh. And at night, they were, I would wake up with bloody sheets. And at that point, they had convinced me that it was in my head and I had completely lost my mind. I continued to get sicker and sicker. And I actually had cutaneous larva migraines. Go look it up or don't look it up. You don't want to see the photos, but they're skin burrowing parasites. They multiply by the hundreds and they swim through the top layer of your skin above your muscle layer. So I had thousands of parasites swimming through every inch of my skin. You can see them and they would hit your hair shaft and they would make your hair stand on edge. Oh it God. was probably one of the most, exactly, Victor, I see your comment, completely horrifying. I didn't know it was worse. Knowing that I had 
parasites swimming in my body or thinking that I had lost my mind to the point where I was hallucinating and seeing bugs swimming in my skin. It took me going and I had had them for over a month and a half before finally going to an island doctor who was a native and who was familiar with conditions like this. Five minutes in the office, she took a skin biopsy and she pulled a worm out and she's like, this is what you have. So let, let me let me just ask you, did, did you go back to those doctors that were telling you it was all in your head and be, being like, see, I told you this wasn't the case? I did. I did. And it, they did apologize. But that's nice of them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Many doctors don't. But, yeah. but they, they did. And they're like, oh, we do see that you did have parasites. So unfortunately, I'd had it for so long, it took a few months for my body to be able to fight them off. And when you take the antiparasitic drugs, because they don't enter your bloodstream or your gut, your body actually excretes them out your pores as this white pussy material. So I was completely horrified. I was completely grossed out. I was in constant pain because they kept biting and swimming. I couldn't sleep at night because they were more active during the night. It was absolutely horrible. I was still, and I was going to medical school. So I was pulling all nighters and studying for exams and I went into the final and I was passing and I was just proud that I was able to get through the, that whole semester. But I was so sleep deprived and so sick. I went into the final completely exhausted and I actually failed by one point. It was the first thing I had failed. I had been a straight A student my entire life and I had the biggest opportunity of my life and I ended up failing my final by one point. So at that point, I had to have what the school called an I failed sale, where you take all your books and all your supplies that you accumulated while you were on the island and sit out on the front lawn of the school and sell off your belongings before you get in a plane and you fly home. Hold on, they, so, so they, wouldn't, they wouldn't let you like retake the class or? No, I sat for a committee and I, I fought my case and they thought that I was too much of a liability and high risk to allow me to continue oh, that's in their program. That, so that's I got home and honestly, that was my rock bottom. I was completely depressed. I was absolutely devastated. Family was disappointed in me. Friends were disappointed in me. I was now an embarrassment to the family that their daughter was no longer in medical school and they couldn't brag to their friends about it. Friends started to disappear and I was so depressed I wasn't moving and pain started to set in. I had vascular, nerve, bone, and muscle issues in my leg. Chronic pain was so severe, they kept trying all of these procedures for pain controls, nerve blocks, bare blocks, epidural nerve blocks. I'd be admitted for weeks of epidural treatment to try to reset my nervous system so that I would decrease my or increase my threshold to pain and nothing was working. I sat down with a team of specialists and basically they told me that there was nothing else that they can do for me and that I needed to come to terms with the fact that I would be living a life of chronic pain. So was it during that conversation that they brought up to you the elective amputation or did... No, did, amputation was never on the table. So here I am, um, 30, 32 years old, and I have a prognosis of not having anything to help me get out of pain except for electing to be in a wheelchair and finally allowing them to put me on chronic narcotics. And I thought to myself, this is, this is not the life for me. And I don't have many regrets in life, but I do have one. At that point, I had, I had given up. And on my 32nd birthday, I had a, a sigh attempt. I injected all of my blood thinners and was hoping I would just peacefully go to sleep, and that my pain and suffering would be over. But my husband sensed 
that something was wrong. And he decided to surprise me and come home and take me out for lunch. And he saved me. That was my true rock bottom. And from that moment on, I have not given up on anything. I have never considered myself broken. And I started that tenuous climb back up out of that hole to where I am today. Doctors at that point realized that I was truly in so much pain that they needed to do something permanently about it. So it was at that point that they finally put on the table elective amputation. That's disgusting that they even let it go that far. I mean, it's, that's terrible. So then they put elective amputation on the table and it was a surgeon that had known me since I was a teenager. And he told me, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I can't make that cut. He said, as a surgeon, my job is to save your leg. You still have blood flow. It's still biologically salvageable. We can do a series of additional fusions and plating and maybe a nerve transfer. And maybe we could wrap the nerve and myelin sheaths and hopefully cut down the pain. And I told him that I was done and that I was ready for the elective. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't do it for you. So then the next year was interviewing different surgeons in Boston until I find somebody that was willing to actually do the amputation. That's, that's incredible. It, it's like you really had to, no pun intended, put your foot down. And they couldn't see that, that, you, that you were in so much pain. I don't, I don't understand. I was in so much pain, and they had put me on really high-dose narcotics. And I was absolutely miserable going into that surgery. But it was a difficult decision to make. But when my husband looked at me and said, let's just get rid of that ugly foot, you'll be better off. I knew that that was the right decision for me. So I went in for my elective below the knee amputation. And luck has never been on my side. I went in in April of 2013. I had come out of the OR and I had been recovering for a few days when all of a sudden the hospital goes on lockdown. We're watching the news and I really thought it was just a really bad movie or maybe it was the pain meds. The Boston Marathon bombing was transpiring outside. Oh my God. And the shooter several days later was brought to the same hospital that I was at and was on the same floor that I was on. So all of the nurses that were supposed to be providing me pain medication and giving me the care that I needed post-op, there was nobody there. I was on nobody's radar. Then finally, the surgical team said, we need to send you to Spalding at least for a few days before you get kicked out for the influx of patients that are going through. And they did just that. I had a very quick rehab. It was kind of a half-ass rehab too. So, because it was the same week that Boston, that Spalding was opening their brand new hospital in Charlestown. So I was the very last patient discharged from Boston as they opened the new hospital and opened their doors for all the bombing survivors. So, so let, me, let me ask you this. Like, was there some type of lottery system that, that they said, okay, the patients that are here already, they're going to go over there, and then the marathon bombing victims are going to come here like how how did that work how did that call be made that you were going to go over to spalding i didn't go over to spalding charlestown they decided that they didn't have the resources to be able to treat that many amputees at the same time normally there's only four or five maybe eight at most on the floor there were over 20 amputees and plus there were other people with vascular injuries and orthopedic injuries so the whole hospital is completely flooded with patients from the marathon bombing. So I was sent home. I did go back to Spalding Charlestown for my outpatient, but the prosthetic companies were flooded too. So there was a, there was, there was more need than there were resources at that given moment. And I was stuck in that unfortunate situation. So I got fit for a prosthetic, but then they didn't have time to keep up with all of the changes So it was huge and it didn't fit well. I started my physical therapy at Spalding, but 
they didn't have enough trained gate trainers to work with everybody one-on-one. So what they did was they put all of our beds in a circle and we did all of our physical therapy together. And at that moment, I was really fortunate that I had several young amputees that I can do my rehab with. They were all around my age and they had all gone through something traumatic. Like I had gone through something traumatic and here we were championing each other as we each worked on our own recovery. I was in physical therapy with Jeff Bauman and Heather Abbott and Roseanne Sedoya, uh, Jessk and Pat Kensky, um, Will Loftenhauser. So we, we were a little tribe that did our rehab together, but what was unfortunate was that they all got multiple legs before I even had a leg to walk in myself. So unfortunately, my bone pushed through the skin and I needed to go in for a major revision surgery where I lost an additional six inches of my leg. That was a real turning point. That was a point where it started to affect my husband and he made some unhealthy choices for himself and he was struggling. He didn't want to see his wife have to go through what she just went through two years into the process. We thought that An elective amputation would give me a better quality of life. And here I was faced with having to go through a major revision where I lost another six inches of my leg. I had switched prosthetic companies. And honestly, it was probably one of the best decisions I've made. I now am a next step um, bionics and prosthetics patient. And they have become a second family for me. They have stuck with me every step of the way. They even went to my appointment to the surgeon before I went in for that revision surgery. And they have worked tirelessly through all of my multiple revisions to be able to get me back up on my feet and active again. That's awesome. Now I wanna fast forward a little bit um, because you are an alum of the Adaptive Training Foundation Mm -hmm. in Dallas, Texas. And for um, those of you who don't know what the Adaptive Training Foundation is. It's a gym down in Dallas, Texas that works with adaptive athletes. It's a six-week program. Um, They break you down to build you back up. And Melissa talked about it a little bit in her open. But how did you hear about that? And how did you make that decision to say, you know what, I have to take the six, nine weeks, whatever it is, to really work on myself and uproot your life and move down to Dallas, Texas and do what you've done? So again, fate's a funny thing. Had I not lost my leg the same week as the Boston Marathon bombing, I would not be friends with Heather Abbott. And I wouldn't have been at one of her marathon race fundraisers. There, there was a recipient of bilateral cosmetic high-heeled prosthetics. And she was a recent graduate of the ATF program. She had flown up from Texas and was there to share her story when she accepted her new prosthetic legs. We hit it off and an hour into the fundraiser, she's like, you absolutely need to put in an application and go down to this amazing gym. I'm like, it sounds incredible and I can't believe that Boston doesn't have anything like it. So after a discussion with my husband and saying, look, there isn't a resource like this, I need to just put in an application and." Who knows? At that point, I didn't consider myself an athlete anymore. And I'm like, I probably won't get accepted, but I'll at least try. I then go to the Amputee Coalition National Conference. And that year in North Carolina, David Vibera, Hunter Clark, and a few of the athletes came. And they did an expo, an adaptive fitness boot camp, the day before the conference started. So the day before, I get a phone call from the David Vibera himself, and he said, I can't wait to give you the biggest bear hug ever. He's like, this is your interview. Show me what you got at the boot camp. So here I am in the hall, like nervously filling (laughs) up my water bottle at the bubbler because I'm going to meet the David Vibera. And all of a sudden, this big, like, Spartan creature comes behind (laughs) me, lifts me off my feet, and gives me the biggest bear hug ever. 
I was completely shocked. He's like, I told you I was going to give you a bear hug. <laughs> to, stop you, to stop you real quick, for those, those of you who don't know who David is, what was his profession beforehand? Just to David, paint the picture. David was an NFL linebacker who sustained, he was actually Mr. Irrelevant. So he was the very last draft pick for the NFL team. Unfortunately, he sustained a traumatic shoulder injury and he went through his own rehab. He went through his own pain medication, alcohol detox and recovery as well. And he ended up starting a professional gym called the Performance Vault in Dallas to train professional athletes. One day he's in a parking lot and he meets a quadruple amputee, Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, um, of Maine, and he was the very first ATF athlete. David said, look, man, when was the last time you worked out? And Travis is like, what are you talking about? I'm missing both my arms and my legs. I obviously haven't worked out in a long time. And he said, well, tomorrow morning, come meet me at my gym. And that was the beginning of ATF. David was so inspired by Travis that he then launched the Adaptive Training Foundation, which is now a uh, 5013C Foundation, and they also have a headquarters gym in Carrollton, Texas, where they train classes of 10 to 15 adoptive athletes quarterly. So I had met David, I went to the boot camp, I gave it my all, and the next morning he gave me a call and told me that he can't wait to welcome me down in Dallas. I packed up what I needed and I went down there, but me being the very like OCD type A rigid planner, I wanted an itinerary and a pack list and I wanted to know where I was living and what my transportation was and how would I get food? And they said, you just need to trust the process. Now you just show up. <laughs> hold, hold on one second. Before you just show up and, and you, get, you get the phone call and you, you know you're going down there, what was your realistic expectation? going into it, not really knowing what you were going to experience. What was your expectation? After seeing the boot camp and what was possible, I saw it as a huge opportunity. And honestly, I had nothing to lose going down there. I had only so much to gain. And I decided that I was going to give it my all. And the first day I show up, I go to the head trainer and I said, I have a high pain tolerance and physically I'm sure that I could do anything you throw at me. But he said, what do you want to work on while you're down here? And I said, there's a lot of pent up anger and feelings about my journey thus far, things that have happened. And I want to be able to let those go and be able to really move on and to fully heal and move on with my life with a positive mindset and a positive future. So they threw everything at me, uh, battle tanks, battle ropes, uh, any type of exercise you could think of it. They even had me skateboarding on a powerized one wheel by the end of the program. Uh, absolutely incredible program. I had some of the best coaches and mentors. But my biggest challenge was adapting to all of the circumstances that they put me in where they knew that they were going to push my buttons and stress me out because their whole concept is we will break you down, but give you the tools to rebuild yourself into a stronger version of yourself. So we had a mindset meditation coach, uh, Morris Brosette. I call him my Moda, <laughs> my little Yoda. Um, he was our mindset meditation and yoga instructor. And he challenged us at the beginning of every workout uh, to close our eyes and meditate. He gave us journal assignments but he pulled me aside and he said, your journal assignment throughout this program is to write down your entire story. He said, I want it all. I want it raw, real, the good, the bad, the ugly. He's like, you need to get that story out. So I start journaling and he's like, oh my God, I had no idea that you had been through all of that. He's like, keep going, keep writing your story. So towards the end of the program, I finished my journal and he's like, I know I promised you that I would be the only person that would read it. But he said, I got to admit, he goes, your story was too good. I had to give it to David himself. He's actually on a plane right now and he's reading your journal on his business trip. He'll be back in a few days. 
There we go. <laughs> so they end up, he ends up reading the story and he's like, you need to start to share your story publicly, all of it, not your elevator pitch, not the glossed over version that you think people want to hear. You need people, you need to share your whole story so people really understand who you are and where you've come from. Before going down to ATF, I, my friends and family had disappeared. I had two siblings who had weddings coming up and they wanted perfect, beautiful, symmetric wedding photos. And I was asked to not be part of the wedding party and was ultimately not welcome at the wedding. And for me, if people ask, what was that switch where you truly owned being an amputee and finally got your confidence back? It was that moment. It was that moment of absolute hurt that I decided that there's a line where there's basic human respect. And if my own family couldn't, expect, couldn't respect me for who I was, then there wasn't a place for them in my life and my journey. And the next day I went onto the website, Alleles, A-L-L-E-L-E-S, they're out of Canada. And I bought one of the most beautiful, badass, caged 3D print laser cutted cover that I could find. And from that day forward, I haven't hid my leg and I've been proud to be the person that I am. That was, so I was still processing all of those feelings of hurt and sadness when I was at ATF. So David challenged me to finally share my story publicly and I shared it at the University of North Texas. But right before that, I was so stressed by the idea that David had read my journal. I literally got onto my phone and I looked up yoga near me. I had this sudden urge to go to a yoga class. So here I go, there's a Hatha yoga 30 minutes away in the town of Frisco at Hot Body Yoga. And I'm like, you know what? I said I was going to go to the first class near me, and this is it. So I show up. The room was dimly lit. It felt like it was over 100 degrees. <laughs> yeah. uh -oh. But I, because of my training at ETF, I had built up the strength and the flexibility to be able to keep up with people in the class. So here I am. I'm going through... The, the class, but you know, as amputees, we sweat a lot. So halfway through, I had to take off my leg and dump out sweat. But all the yoga instructor saw was my leg bending in half as I took it off. And she freaked out and thought that I broke my leg. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I'm just dumping out sweat. I'm good. Just keep going. <laughs> so I put my leg back on and I finished the class. And the minute the class was over, the whole class sat around my Matt, and they're like, you need to share your story with us. And the yoga instructor said, we have a yoga instructor training class this weekend. And the topic is self-love and self-acceptance. We'd love for you to come and share your story and share your journey of finding your confidence again. So I told David and I told Mo, and I'm like, okay, I have the opportunity. And they're like, this is it this is the first time you're going to share your pub story publicly. David and his wife, Sarah came to support me and they videoed it for me. And one of my classmates, Sergeant Derek Ross, who we've had on the podcast previously, he came to support me. And here I am, I'm, I'm a plus size adaptive athlete and I'm sitting on a stool in a yoga studio, part of my French, with these very perfect skinny yoga bitches. <laughs> <laughs> all spread out in a circle around me and I am supposed to stand there and give them a talk about self-love and self-acceptance. But I feel like God was speaking through my lips that day and my story flowed. People laughed and cried. They were on edge. And finally at the end when they stopped videotaping, they asked if I could have a private Q&A and they asked me everything. There was a girl that was in the class that was contemplating suicide that week and came up to me and gave me the longest embrace and just sobbed and thanked me for sharing, my, for being brave enough and vulnerable enough 
to share my story because it gave her hope that better days were ahead for her. So what I've learned in the process is that you need to challenge yourself to become vulnerable enough that you can share the real you because how can people relate if you're giving them a glossed over version of yourself? Just the so my view. daily challenge is to continue to challenge myself to be vulnerable in real so that I can show other people that if I have gone through this journey and I have survived and I'm on the other side of it and I'm thriving, you can too. And in the process, I'm still a work in progress. I like to refer to myself as perfectly imperfect. And there's a Japanese culture where when there's a bowl or a plate that is broken, they will glue the pieces together and they will paint the cracks in gold because then they celebrate the beauty of the flaws. And that image has always stuck with me. And there's actually a sculpture, it's called the Expansion. And it's a statue of a woman cross-legged meditating, but her body is broken. And from the inside, there's a light that shines out. So when I'm having a tough day or if I need that point to visualize on, that's my go-to image. Before every workout at ATF, they trained us to visualize yourself, visualize your body moving the way you want it to move, and eventually your body will start to move in that manner. And when things get tough, always return to your breath and always return to that powerful image that you've created for yourself that holds your strength and your beauty in it. No. And for me, that's what got me through the training. That's what got me through the program. That's what got me through that first talk and then the second talk and the end of the program. That, that's, that's an amazing story. I mean, we're, we're at nine o'clock, but I just say we just keep going because we haven't even hit the tip of the iceberg yet. Because I, I want to like fast forward a little bit if I could to yeah. how, did, how, did, how did you um, come about starting Adaptively Able Amputees and then Adaptively Able Fitness? So, again, the passion and the spark for me starting it came from, again, that place of hurt. Friends and family were not around when I needed them most, and I felt so socially isolated. It was a horrible feeling. I'm a very social, outgoing person, and I hated feeling trapped in my own body and in my own house. There were days that, sorry about my dog. <laughs> There were days that all I craved. Mike, <laughs> Mike contain the dog. <laughs> there were days that all I craved was to go out for an iced coffee and not being able to drive yet and not having anybody that was able to take me. Like anytime I was able to just get out of my house and enjoy simple things in life, I felt like a new person. So I vowed that when I got back on Two Good Feet that I wanted to start a social activity and support group for those living with limb loss. We first started as a social meetup group called Amp Up Your Social Life Boston. And we got together for coffee houses. We went out to dinner. We had cookouts and holiday parties. We went canoeing, kayaking, sailing, bowling, movie nights. If you could think of it, we've probably done it. We morphed from a social meetup group to an official support group based out of Spalding um, Rehab Hospital in Cambridge. But then our mission kind of outgrew the hospital walls because we wanted to go out into the community and have social activities and outings. So at that point, I decided to turn the, non turn the meetup group into an official nonprofit called Adaptively Abled Amputees. And then there was this girl with this crazy idea that Boston didn't have a program like ATF and that I needed to do something about it. When I left ATF, I was so sad that I couldn't stay and live down there and be part of that perpetual community. And what David told me was, I want you to take everything that we taught you and bring it home to your community 
and make a difference with it. So that's what I did. I networked with some of the top fitness, mindset, meditation, wellness, and holistic health professionals, physical therapists, occupational therapists, fitness instructors of every discipline, adaptive trainers. I recruited peer trainers. So people who had physical disabilities that were very active in fitness and that can serve as role models to the current class. And I was, over, I was overwhelmed, and we had over 60 individuals from the rehab, fitness, and wellness communities volunteer their time to help me bring out my passion and my dream of bringing an adaptive functional fitness and wellness program to the adaptive community in Boston. Me, being a clinical trial coordinator and researcher at heart in my training, I turned it into a pilot program. We collected pre-post data. We analyzed strength, flexibility, endurance, um, and we gave each athlete a before and after survey, asking questions about quality of life, satisfaction with life, and mental health. And across the board, over the course of the six weeks, we met twice a week for individualized training, group community training, and then wellness seminars, including mindset meditation, massage therapy, yoga, and nutrition. At the end of those six weeks, everybody improved across the board in each of the categories. We had below knee amputees, above knee amputees. We had a bilateral below knee, a bilateral above knee. We had individuals with CP, spinal cord injury, and neurological conditions. And honestly, to date, Graduating that first class of 10 adaptive athletes was probably one of my biggest accomplishments and one of my proudest moments because I proved that I could get off the couch and I can change my life and then I could help others to do the same. So following that program, I went out and I attained several certifications. I am a certified adaptive CrossFit instructor through the Adaptive Training Academy and also through Crossroads. Adaptive Athletic Alliance, I returned to ATF, and I got certified as an adaptive exercise specialist, and then I rolled in a 300-hour in-the-gym personal training program from the American Academy of Personal Training, which I just graduated, so now I'm able to train both adaptive and able-bodied athletes and continue adaptively able to fitness. Congratulations. That. That's absolutely awesome. So you just wrapped up something really exciting um, the other night, along with the adaptive, uh, adaptively able fitness fall program, and I think this is this is something truly special, as that is too. But this, given our our current circumstances with COVID, why don't you tell people what you just wrapped up last night? So when COVID hit, we had a choice of either caving in or catching up with the 21st century and going virtual to be able to continue to provide that support and that social outlet for people during one of the most challenging times that our world has probably faced, or at least we have faced as a society to date. So I started offering virtual support groups, adaptive fitness classes, social hours, spa nights for the ladies, We had a different variety of virtual offerings, but I felt like we needed to see each other. We needed to come together as a community. But in doing so, we had to be very respectful of the fact that we're in a pandemic. There was a lot of planning and thought that went into being able to offer an adaptive outdoor, socially distanced, adaptive fitness program Monday nights. It ran for the last six weeks, and we concluded this past Monday We followed all of the policies and guidelines. We had strict COVID pre-screening questions. We had specific waivers for COVID. And we had a very strict sanitation protocol to sanitize equipment. We had a mask policy and we made sure that all of the stations were gridded out greater than 12 feet apart, giving people ample space. And to see the faces of the athletes go through the program and be able to, one, be outside, enjoying the fresh air, seeing members of their community and getting a good workout with in-person instruction, it, it's priceless. And 
to see the progress that people made in just six short weeks. We went through the entire program, everybody improved, and everybody stayed safe and healthy. So it just proves that if you put the work in and you're thoughtful about your programs and you follow strict policies and procedures, we can start to emerge and return to what we're going to call our new normal. So I'm excited to work with different gyms and organizations to find indoor space so we can offer a smaller version of the program we offered last year, but still be able to offer something in person for the adaptive community. So that that's awesome. And I can't wait to see what you do with that because no doubt it's going to be great and you're going to continue to touch lives and, and make an impact here in Boston and, and abroad, literally. Um, so, so let me ask you, you know, if you, if you had a crystal ball and you could map out maybe one or two of your best wishes, what would they be for you personally? Immediately, I had a big birthday recently. And due to my recovery and all the trailblazing starting nonprofits and programs, we've put off starting a family. So I think my next big personal goal is to start to work towards starting my own family because it was the thought of being stuck on my couch, trapped in my body, wondering whether I could ever be an active mom that got me off that couch initially, that got me to apply to ATF, and that has motivated me to keep pushing despite setbacks and multiple surgeries, to keep pushing forward, to become the healthiest, fittest version of myself so that I can. And I've met other adaptive individuals who have been amazing role models and they're amazing parents. And by having them as mentors, it's given me the motivation to know that I'm not only capable, but I'm going to kill it and crush it just like every other challenge I've faced. And then professionally, my goal is to be able to continue to grow the nonprofit. So initially, it was called Adaptively Abled Amputees, and it was a group that was open to people with just limb loss. But then I had other adaptive friends say, your outings are really fun. Could we come too? So we actually rewrote the mission to include anybody with a physical disability. And when I launched Adaptively Able Fitness, I opened it up to anybody with any physical disability. And it's been so amazing to see what I've learned from other members of the community. And what James and I realized is that there's not a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of standalone organizations and we're all serving the same community. We all have the same mission and goals. We are so much stronger when we work together, so we need to collaborate. So that was kind of the thought that James and I, during multiple conversations, we had an opportunity during COVID to run and co-host the Spartan Unbreakable podcast. And when that series ended, we're like, why don't we just start our own podcast and we'll call it the Adaptive Collaborative. So I'm really excited that we're now, this is episode 11. Um, we're getting ready to release all of our episodes onto YouTube and to Spotify and iTunes and other podcast platforms. I want to see this podcast grow. I want to collaborate with other adaptive groups. I want to form an organization of adaptive trainers where we can refer individuals to different trainers in different areas so that they're able to work with people that have experience and know how to work with the adaptive community. I would love to see adaptively abled fitness grow. Right now we're a traveling gym model and that comes with its own challenges. We're exposing different gyms in different areas to being able to learn from the adaptive community, thus expanding our reach. But eventually I would love to be able to have our own brick and mortar space and work on attaining corporate sponsorships that will enable us to do that. I'd like to be able to have a building to call our home where our tribe can meet, where we could have social events, but also adaptive workouts. And that's one of my overall goals. And eventually, I hope to eventually sh put my story officially on paper and work towards publishing my story and my own book. 
it's gonna it's gonna happen, and then it's gonna go the New York Times bestseller, and then the <laughs> the rest is gonna be history. But I just have a couple quick questions before I pass it over to the audience because I think that's really important because I see the chat box lighting up. So, um, what? Well, not it. Let's let's face it. Not everybody is as confident as as you have been, and it's been something that you've worked on. But you've always had a sense of perseverance. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this no matter what. So if you are speaking to somebody that's either gonna watch us now or hear it in the future, whenever the case may be, what is one quick piece of advice that you would give them to break out of that shell and own who they are? Be you. One of my favorite quotes, and I think it's anonymous, is be you, the world will adjust. You are beautiful just the way you are, and your story will unfold in its own time. When I was off on the island, I was running into a brick wall repetitively. And even though maybe it wasn't the best decision, I was stubborn and there's a difference between being perseverant and being stubborn. And at that point I was stubborn. I was going to finish something. I didn't, re- I didn't take a step back and realize that there were other paths for me. And maybe there was another path that was meant for me. And maybe this journey was God's plan for me. And my story was being paved for me. And I needed to know that all of this wasn't happening to me. It was happening for me because in the process, I've become a stronger person. Any advice to somebody who's struggling right now is take a step back. Take a look at everything that you've accomplished thus far. You have survived every single one of your worst days and you're still here and you will continue to do so. Take that challenge, break it up into smaller goals, and take it one step at a time. And yes, you may take two or three steps forward and a step back, but as long as it really doesn't matter, you're not really stepping back, you're just stepping in another direction. So your steps are always forward. So keep taking those baby steps forward, and eventually you'll start to accomplish your goals. And I like to say to anybody that I work with, I mentor or I train, I'm still a work in progress. I'm still working on me. So join me in this journey and let's work on ourselves together. And let's champion each other because we are so much stronger when we work together and when we celebrate each other. There's really no room for negativity, only positivity. And yeah, we'll have our bad days, but when you do, Take that brief moment, have your mini pity party, but set a timer. Set a timer for a half hour, call that friend and vent. I highly encourage people seeking out mental health practitioners. Get a therapist. They're your sounding board. Have that mini vent session. Take a deep breath. Set yourself and move on because there's really nothing that you can't accomplish. I've been through multiple challenges and multiple setbacks, but truly if you stay perseverant, you stay grateful for everything you have in your life. You accept the grace to forgive yourself for past mistakes and allow yourself to move on. I'm going to cut you off right there. I know you are. I know what you're going to ask. It's going to lead into my next question. And this was a specific question that I not only had, but Beth had. So thank you, Beth, for this question. When we started the Spartan podcast, one of the questions that you came up with was, what does great gratitude and grace mean to you? So just real quick, can you tell us, one, where did you come up with that um, question? And then follow it up with what those words mean to you individually. So I, I had to sit and reflect on my journey and decide how to share the story. I was very honored to be the commencement speaker for the Lynn Classical High School COVID class of 2020 and sitting there scratching my head wondering, what do I tell these students as they're embarking into the unknown? I started to reflect on my own journey and 
found that these three principles are what helped me to get to where I am today. First and foremost, you need to be grateful. No matter what's going on in your life or how challenging things are, there are always things to be grateful. And if you practice gratitude and you're in a state of gratitude, there's no room to be depressed. There's no room to be angry. There's no room to be sad or despondent. So at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, whether I write it down in a journal, if I put it in a post or if I just say it to myself on a busy day when I'm rushing to get ready, I always think of three things and I'm always rushing to get ready. (laughs) What are three things I'm grateful for? And every single day you could always find three. And if you focus on the positivity and the things that you're grateful for, really you could get through any situation. Next is grace. You need to allow yourself the grace to forgive yourself for past mistakes, for for some of maybe your negative qualities or things that come out in troubling times. Allow yourself that grace to sit with your emotions and to forgive yourself for anything that's happened. Forgive yourself for a bad day. Forgive yourself for that thing that you blurted out when you really didn't mean to say it. Give yourself the grace to forgive yourself, to let go of the past so that you can move on. Because truly, you cannot heal unless you allow yourself the grace to forgive yourself, to let go, and to move forward in a positive manner. And grit. It's my grave, it's my absolute favorite book by Angela Duxworth. And she talks about a grit scale and how she, many professionals are adopting this grit scale as a way to be able to parse out the best from the rest in interviews. And as I interviewed staff for my own program, I actually tested them with the grit scale. And what the grit scale shows are, are you gritty? Are you perseverant? Are you willing to set your eyes on a goal and no matter what obstacles come your way, continue to work towards it? In order to get through challenges, especially challenges that are faced in the adoptive community, you need to work hard and you need to get gritty to be able to continue to move forward and to accomplish your goals. So those are my three Gs. Some people have three Ps or three Ts, but these are Melissa's three Gs, gratitude, grace, and grit. Absolutely love that. And I think, I think, that is a perfect opportunity to pass it over to the audience to ask questions. But I want to thank you so much for sharing your story. And I, I, I beg and plead with people that are going to hear this later to open up and share your story because it's going to um, be therapeutic for somebody else. And it's going to be therapeutic for you as well. So open up, share your story, be vulnerable, as Melissa said, and, you know, just own who you are and be proud of it. Be proud of it whether it's an amputation and you have a prosthetic leg, rock that leg, make the thing look the best it can. If you're in a wheelchair, be the best thing on wheels you can be. And um, you know what, with that, I want to, like I said, pass it over to the audience. So now I ask the people. You know what, wear your uh, leg confidently. Oh shoot. Because I completely blinged it out and I have never been more proud to walk with a smooth gait and wear an absolutely gorgeous leg and be proud of the person I am. Heck yeah, let's, let's go. You, you, and, you and Judy Gray, I swear, I can't <laughs> take you guys anywhere. You guys steal the show all the time, but wouldn't have it any other way. But, all right, so I told you guys to come with questions, so fire away. I have one other question. Okay. If we got time. So, and it's for, actually for both of you. Um, because you were both born with challenges. And I was wondering how you dealt with bullying in school, if I'm sure it happened, and um, what, if anything, your, you and your parents in the school did to either help you or they didn't do anything at all. Just curious what your thoughts were about that. So right. if you, you wanna go, James, quick. No, no, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. It's you. So being born with a club foot, I had multiple braces and I had what they call reverse last shoes. So rather the curve of the foot going inward 
it curved outward to try to correct the position of my foot. And they were not cute. There were these burgundy red clunky saddle shoes. And I went to a private Catholic school where everybody was in uniform, but the only way that you could express yourself was with your footwear or with a cute hair bow, you know, at the time when I was in elementary school. And there were some mean girls that would make fun of my shoes. But there was a girl in my class, and I'll never forget it. She pulled me aside and she said, look, my dad's an amputee. And honestly, that was the very first amputee that I ever met, and I'll never forget that. And the next time I went over her house, her dad showed me the leg, and he said, you didn't even know, did you? And they're like, you walk really well. It doesn't matter what's on your feet. It's how you carry yourself and what you do in the process. And that really helped me own who I was as a child. High school was a little bit more difficult because of all the surgeries. My feet were two completely different sizes. I had a size eight and a size 11. So it was pretty significant. So on every team, when we had to order the team cleats or court shoes, I had to order two pairs and it was very obvious. So my nickname on sports teams was eight. Well, my foot was a a 10 at that moment. It's now an 11, but it was a 10 as I was growing. And my nickname was called 810. And you know what? I just rolled with it. And when we had our powder puff and we got to put our nicknames on the back of the shirt, I proudly put 810 because you know what? What I joked was that nobody could ever walk in my shoes because they don't have an 8 and a 10. And I just kind of... Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's awesome. Um, for me, yes, I was bullied, but I have to give credit first and foremost to my faith. That that played a huge part and still plays a huge part in, to who I am today and my family. You know, um, I give my family a lot of credit because they never treated me any different. And they they were very caring and loving but at the same time they didn't coddle me and they they made sure that i knew that the world was going to be a rough and rugged place but when it when it turned out to be rough and rugged they they were there to love me to to boost me up and be like hey own who you are because you're going to make a difference in this world and the other thing that or the other person that really stuck out to me was uh, a teacher i had because growing up i wasn't very confident in myself and I would go I would go to school do the work come home and watch sports and I wasn't even going to go to my prom and we fought back and forth my senior year you're going to your prom no you're not going to your prom well fast forward I ended up going to my prom and that was kind of the first time I came out of my shell a little bit and really saw what the world could be for me and it was a little bit of foreshadowing to where I'm at today and you know, it was that educator that really took me under her wing. And there was a group of them that said, you know what, we're here for you. We, we got you. Don't worry about it. And they instilled that confidence in me when I didn't have it in myself. That's awesome, because I have a couple letters in my drawer like that after teaching for 37 years. And yeah, it's, it's um, yeah. I've well, thank you. Me. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. It's so important. And you help mold. I'm so glad I'm retired. <laughs> Teachers truly help mold yes, they our do. future society. Whether and they're they know there during those very awkward years yeah. to kind of help those that are struggling to find themselves. Yeah. To put, they, learn what a good work ethic is. Right. And to learn to adapt to situations as they enter the real world. I find it interesting of students who come back 10 years later and say, you were such an influence on me, Mrs. Hudson, and I, you don't even know it. You know, you don't even know what you're, what something that you say in class can do to a kid ever. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons I love teaching. Well, thank you. Yeah, so well, thank you guys. You were awesome. You're teachers, Emily. too, you know, you're teachers. Yeah, I have a question um, for both of you. Um, so... I'm in San Diego, California, as you know, um, but I'll be in Boston in a couple months. But 
Um, being for, in San Diego, what can I do as an adaptive athlete um, to be – first of all, you had mentioned a few other things besides the Thursday night and this podcast. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. And I was wondering if for people who aren't in Boston, how can we get involved? What can we do? Um, I can't believe I'm in San Diego right next to two different, um, you know, military, and we don't have anything like that here. I mean, we have challenged athletes, but they don't, it's, it's very different now. They don't, anyway. So what can I do from a state away? Um, and then when I come to Boston, if you're in the middle of a session, can I come jump in and hang out? Come jump in, hang out. I, I worked really hard to attain the certifications that I needed personally to be able to work with adaptive athletes. So anybody that's in the need of personal training and direction, I feel completely comfortable training people over Zoom. It's how I learned to train in addition to the in-person program because COVID kind of happened while I was undergoing my personal training classes. So it forced me to adapt to a new platform. And with this new platform, I realized I can not only help people in my own community here in Boston, but I've been able to reach out to other people and affect the lives of people across the U.S. <laughs> I was asked by the amputee coalition to run their first Thursday of the month, and it will now be an ongoing series. Oh, I run their support group at seven o'clock the first Thursday of every month. And through that, I've been able to network and meet people across the country and even individuals in Europe um, through the virtual offerings. So we have the support group on Thursdays. We have a social hour on Sundays. We have an adaptive fitness workout on Wednesdays at noon. And Emily, I was just revamping all of our meeting IDs and all of our offerings and I'm going to be sending it to you and others who requested it at the support okay. group meeting, but we have several virtual offerings. And now that I've had a moment to kind of step back after the in-person program and I'm starting to plan for a future class, I'm realizing that we're going to need to offer a hybrid model. So we don't know where Corona COVID society our economy is going to go in this next year. I have already been told that I'll be working remote through the summer of 21. So knowing that and knowing that the landscape is changing, we're going to have, we're adaptive athletes. We're an adaptive program. We need to adapt with the times and we need to be able to offer if we're able to one night a week in person. But I think the other night is going to be virtual. That way, people that are not here in our direct community could join us. And yeah. then if gyms or locations get shut down, we're already on a virtual platform. We could continue to go and not skip a beat, and we could run the rest of the program virtually. And in addition to that, we could offer the program to people anywhere in the U.S. that's able to log on at that time, and we hope to eventually catch up even more with the 21st century to be able to record the sessions and to record basic workout moves. So I just presented at the Amputee Coalition National Conference with one of my very dear friends and collaborators, Trevor Bunch, on getting fit and finding your tribe. It was a presentation where both of us went through each of the functional movements in multiple variations to help people progress through those. We're hoping to be able to compile those videos and release them on our websites so that people will have a resource where they can go and they'll have a starting point and then they'll have guidance to be able to progress forward. And again, I have a team of adaptive trainers that would be more than happy to work with adaptive athletes. So just reach out to us and we will find a program that's right for you. And the other thing I will add to what Melissa said, um, when you do come back to Boston, there is a Monday morning coffee hour at 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. It's a little early for you being on the West Coast, but if you're up, log on. Then also, um, Lloyd Hawthorne, who has been on the podcast, who's an amazing yoga teacher, does several different 
yoga classes throughout the week here in Boston. Um, in the Friday, the Friday class, Friday afternoon, oh. is donated to adaptively able amputees. It's for every level. So please, when you're in the area, link up with us, and we look forward to having you. What's his? What's that um, name again? I know you Lloyd. last week. Lloyd Hawthorne. Lloyd. So Lloyd. His website. I'm gonna put in the chat right now. And is he doing virtual also right now, or just just? He is doing Instagram Live <laughs> workouts, and I know that he would be more than willing. I know he does privates as well to be able to work with people remotely. Um, he's been a huge champion of the program. He was one of the people that helped recruit multiple fitness and wellness professionals to volunteer for the program. And while you're in town, I'll introduce you to the tribe. We have massage therapists that work with our athletes. We have personal trainers and we have in-person and virtual offerings as long as the climate and our community allow us to do so. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Trandon, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I know you do. You always have questions. <laughs> I love I, it. I just have a question. Who is up there? It's from San Diego. That's our friend Emily. Okay, this. Are you so, in San Diego? I was, well, I was just wondering if you've done stuff with, like, challenged athletes in San Diego, and, like, what do they do? They uh, most, yeah, they have, um, well, when I, when I went down there, I started with the city volleyball, um, and you, I went down, and I could, you could do the biking, um, uh, they don't. And when I went down there, they weren't doing as much like active groups there at Challenge Athletes. They may, basically were more like referrals. Um, they set me up with the with the um, sled hockey, and I did that for a little bit. You know, they sent me around, but I, they didn't seem to have much like consistent stuff going on there where you could really um, kind of get into a tribe and belong. But uh, maybe there is now. Maybe I just went at the wrong time, but. I didn't, I didn't find, it's nothing like what you guys are doing and, and what I feel from when you and James, you know, James and Melissa share, it's like that real bonding life experience. I, yeah. 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 So they're offering a few virtual offerings. Okay. Um, they just sent out a newsletter today, so I could forward that to you, Emily. And okay. I highly suggest habits, but, uh -huh. apply, apply to Adaptive Training Foundation. I did. Okay. Awesome. And I am crossing my fingers, and I will put in a good word. I you already gotten back really, to me. Okay. Oh, she yay. Yes. Okay. She send me the video. I got your video. and it, so Okay. She, yeah, let's go. You would be a great addition to the program. Oh. The thing is, if you don't live in Texas, you can then be part of the tribe virtually, and they're working yes. on virtual platforms. Awesome. Um, they're going to be releasing some virtual <laughs> platforms to the public as part of a data a beta testing program. And I was impressed with what they put together. And then join us where I hope in the fall as the weather is not as nice and we're not able to do as many outdoor workouts to maybe be able to offer more consistent and different times adaptive mm -hmm. fitness workouts where we could get together on Zoom, we could do a workout together and then maybe we could share thoughts on the workout, on our week, on our day. And I'd like to be able to get guest speakers to come on. So I'm looking on our support group to have a mental health counselor come on as a guest speaker, different prosthetic and product companies. And also, I'd love to be able to have uh, Lloyd and some of the wellness professionals come on and talk about different topics so that you can work on active recovery and keeping your body strong and healthy. Emily. Yes. I, I just I just I just thought of something. Um, have you heard of Angel City Games? Mm. Heard of what? Angel City Games? No. Okay. In LA? Yes. So, okay. So they're in LA, and I'm not sure what they're what they're doing um, in terms of events um, because of COVID and all that. But mm. I know that they've done a lot of 
a lot of virtual things as well. They okay. they did um, a concert last week. They had guest speakers. Um, I know that they do some exercise and workout videos and tutorials. So I would definitely look look into connecting with them to see if they can be another avenue for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. Yeah, there's so many resources in this community. And I just want to open the floor to Matt because I know that you're still listening. Do you have any questions for us? If you do, I think you have to unmute your mic. And if not, you know how to reach us. <laughs> <laughs> You could reach us at adaptively abled amputees at gmail.com, which is the nonprofit. And we also have an email address for the podcast, uh, adaptive collaborative podcast at gmail.com. So please reach out to us with questions or if you're ever in a need of resources, and we will try our best to get you connected with the resources that you need. Absolutely. Uh, been an absolute honor to be able to get vulnerable and share my whole story. I know that people have asked and I give it to them in snippets and little pieces because I feel it's a little bit more digestible, but it was great to be able to have this platform tonight to be able to share the whole thing and to be able to field questions from our viewers. Melissa, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and, being such an integral part of this team. I wouldn't be able to do the things I'm able to do without you. But thank you so much for being vulnerable because whether you know it or not, you may get emails, you may get Instagram messages, or you may not at all. You, you've changed lives tonight. So I just want to thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you for everything you do. And thank you to the listeners for, for coming on and supporting us each and every week. We're able to live our dreams because of the things that you guys do. So thank you. We really appreciate you. And Melissa, thank you again so much. My thank closing you. words are success is not measured and how much money you make or all the accolades that you accumulate, but it's truly measured and the number of lives that you impact. And I tr truly feel successful being able to offer programs and services to be able to impact the lives of the adaptive community. I know James feels the same. And we're really excited to be able to provide this platform for people to connect and collaborate. Couldn't agree more. You, you, said, it, you said it best. So I think with that note, we should, we should end it. Thank, Thank you guys. You. Really appreciate it. Hope you guys have an awesome night. Thank you. Thanks, James. Couldn't we'll do this without my partner in crime. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.